Thanks so much. It's been remarkable to be here and to hear everyone's talks. And thank you to Petar and Nathan for inviting me. Um, what I'm going to present to you is, are, are several sections of what's a, a very long chapter from my book. So I hope it hangs together. And um, <clears throat> because uh, in an oral presentation, there's not really the opportunity to read footnotes. Um, there are a couple of people I, I want to thank here. Um, some friends of mine, Naomi Waltham Smith at Penn, Benjamin Stege at Columbia, and Seb Franklin at King's are all friends who have read various versions of this chapter. And uh, since this will be on YouTube, ostensibly someone somewhere will watch it, I'd like to thank them for um, their fantastic and rigorous feedback and their, their traces of their thinking in this paper. Um, <clears throat> Part of what I'll try to do today is think about a form that makes itself known to us chiefly through its residue or after effects, a kind of uh, residua, if you will. And much of what's motivating my, my book project is the question of what's left of listening and of sound after the critique of phonocentrism. And do we just do away with listening and sound, or is there a way to come back. And uh, I want to begin with a passage from Joseph Conrad's only complete aesthetic statement on the novel. He was, unlike Henry James, he, he didn't write prolific prefaces to things. And this preface is one that gives us perhaps his most famous phrase regarding the novelist as an artist. And he writes, my task is to make you hear, to make you feel, it is before all to make you see. And critics of Conrad have mostly lingered on this last part of the phrase, to make you see. And so in some ways, I'm trying to recuperate the other parts of that phrase, to make you hear, to make you feel. Um, I've given you on the handout a, a longer passage from this preface. And what I'd like to do is walk you through the quotations on this handout which I, I, I want to set up in a kind of appositional way uh, that will lead me to what I'm calling in this paper a sinister resonance after Conrad. So the preface, uh, he writes, all art therefore appeals primarily to the senses and the artistic aim when expressing itself in written words must also make its appeal through the senses if its highest desire is to reach the secret spring of responsive emotions. It must strenuously aspire to the plasticity of sculpture, Greg, you'll be interested in this line, to the color of painting, and to the magic suggestiveness of music, which is the art of arts. And it is only through complete, unswerving devotion to the perfect blending of form and substance it is only through an unremitting, never discouraged care for the shape and ring of sentences that an approach may be made to plasticity, to color, and that the light of magic suggestiveness may be brought to play for an evanescent instant over the commonplace surface of words, of the old, old words worn thin, defaced by ages of careless <coughs> usage. It's in the same context that he invokes the work of art in, quote, its vibration, color, form. Conrad here shares in the Wagnerian sense of the total work that is consummated only when presented fully to the senses in performance. There are also echo echoes of Walter Pater's all art constantly aspires towards the condition of music. But we must read the aspiration of prose towards music with a view towards the idealized subject position it is thought to yield. There is intense emphasis on the materiality of words, but the author has disappeared absolutely from their movement. It is not art in its autonomy that aspires to music. There is a, a still emergent subject position that the shape and ring of sentences desires. When Conrad here writes of the shape and ring of sentences, there is the sense that in the sound of the word, form is adequate to content. 
that the sound of the word bears some essential relationship to what it transmits. It rings, but where? Inwardly, in a space totally adequate between word and receiver, who hosts the words, provides by her inwardness its resonating chamber. I've argued at length elsewhere in a published article called A Sinister Resonance that Conrad turned to vibration and resonance as a transnational writer with a tortured relationship to writing and to the speaking voice. Josef Theodor Korzenowski, writing in English as his third language after Polish and French, hated the sound of his voice in its incomplete assimilation. <clears throat> English was for Conrad what Christopher Gogwilt calls a spiritual lingua franca. But the medium of this spirit was above all vibration and resonance itself. The reality of vibration found Conrad on September 9th, 1898, just before beginning Heart of Darkness. Conrad wrote to his editor, Edward Garnett, to describe his astonishment after meeting with a radiologist who had showed Conrad an x-ray of his own hand and played for him a recording of a Polish pianist. And Conrad writes in this letter, the secret of the universe is in the existence of horizontal waves whose varied vibrations are at the bottom of all states of consciousness. And note, all matter, the universe, composed of the same matter, matter, all matter, being only that thing of inconceivable tenuity, which the various vibrations of waves, electricity, heat, sound, light, etc., are propagated, thus giving birth to our sensations, then emotions, then thought. Is this so? So he has in the revelation of vibration a kind of experience of, of the spiritual lingua franca itself, that which surpasses language, a vibrational monad, if you will, which connects all things. And then it answers in a way the most pressing question of the preface to the narcissus, which is how can I reach, how can I reach the reader? The novel begins to vibrate. In this way, we can think of uh, the way that Hegel begins the section on music in the aesthetics. And knowing that we have here lots of people who are interested in Hegel, I decided to print the entire passage because it's absolutely stunning. This is the second passage. The cancellation of space, therefore, consists here only in the fact that a specific sensuous material sacrifices its peaceful separateness, turns to movement, yet so vibrates in itself, there's a typo there, that every, every part of the cohering body not only changes its place, but also struggles to replace itself in its former position. This is an incredible description of what vibration is, struggling to replace itself in its former position. The result of this oscillating vibration is sound or a note, the material of music. Note, with sound, music relinquishes the element of an external form and a perceptible visibility, and therefore needs for the treatment of its productions another subjective organ, namely hearing, which, like sight, is one of the theoretical and not practical senses, and it is still more ideal than sight, for the peaceful and undesiring contemplation of spatial works of art lets them remain in peace and independence as they are, and there is no wish to consume or destroy them. Yet, what it apprehends is not something inherently posited ideally, but on the contrary, something persistent, persisting in its visible existence. The ear, on the contrary, without itself turning to a practical relation to objects, listens to, to the result of the inner vibration of the body through which what comes before us is no longer the peaceful and material shape, but the first and more ideal breath of the soul. The vibrating material enters into negativity on one side of the canceling of the spatial situation, a cancellation that is canceled again by the reaction of the body. Sound is the expression of what he calls a double negation of externality. Quote, an externality which in its coming to be is annihilated again by its very existence and vanishes of itself. <clears throat> 
Music goes further in its negation of objective spatiality by s disturbing motionless material in the vibration of matter. Resounding is more ideal than corporeality, but relinquishes that ideal existence to become what he calls a mode of expression adequate to inner life. Conrad begins his first novel to tell the story of an English crew on a journey home to England, and he titles it The Nigger of the Narcissus. At stake in becoming English, as it passes through in the negation of a racial slur. The second chapter of my book concerns the psychoacoustics of the racial slur in Conrad, its pairing with Narcissus as if in an echo, the scratched out visage in relation to some beautiful and self-reflexively contained face. The torturous experience of hearing himself speak English disappears from the ascendant aesthetic claims of the preface the torturous experience of writing itself, its compulsion, disappears as medium from this totality, and he names this totality vibration. But it escapes us that at a certain point, Conrad no longer conceives of written narrative in explicitly oral or visual terms. And 20 years later, um, reflecting on the Marlowe narrated tales, uh, youth, which was the first one, Heart of Darkness, and then Lord Jim. He writes a new American preface, and this is the third paragraph that I give you. Youth is a feat of memory. It is a record of experience, uh, of an autobiographical experience of his, of his time as a sailor. But that experience in its facts, in its inwardness, and in its outward coloring, begins and ends in myself. Heart of darkness is experience too, but it is experience pushed a little and only a little beyond the actual facts of the case for the perfectly legitimate, I believe, purpose of bringing it home to the minds and bosoms of the readers. There was no longer a matter of sincere coloring. It was like another art altogether. That somber theme had to be given a sinister resonance, a tonality of its own, a continued vibration that I hoped would hang in the air and dwell on the ear long after the last note had been struck. For those of you who've read Heart of Darkness, um, it took Conrad maybe 10 years to go back to his diaries that he had um, taken while he was in the Congo to then write Heart of Darkness. Um, but he was writing his first novel while he was traveling in the Congo and he, he carried the, the draft of that manuscript with him. So it makes it a kind of trans-Pacific, trans-Atlantic text, the, the manuscript traveling around with him. I'll come back to that in a moment. In this second re, uh, revised preface, he writes of a memory that had been more perfectly recorded with youth, then a memory that evades its familiar medium of transmission, resonance and vibration. These objects, by definition, take time. Conrad came to this definition in a much delayed way, as if the writing of the novel was not for him totally complete, as if some act of hearing was still ongoing and would yet continue. A vibration continues, a note hangs. Where and for how long? The inner manifests no longer in an external image, but as a residue. In resonance and vibration, form and medium give way once more than to a structure of occurrence. A structure of occurrence relates to the experience of reading understood as a form of quasi-audition. Reading animates an experience of self-hearing, what Eudora Welty once called a reader voice. It is inward, she writes, and it is inwardly that I listen. Welty attributed to the experience of writing not only the auto-effective warmth of the reader voice, but a familiar timbre, and this was before any sort of content. The warmth of the reader voice for a person with hearing is the condition of possibility of reading and writing before any sort of theme can be imagined. Similarly, Gautamer writes, quote, meaning and the understanding of it are so closely connected with the corporeality of language that understanding always involves an inner speaking as well. 
How are we to approach a sense of form defined fundamentally as resonance and vibration, but in its displaced, redirected, and horizontal effects? Where are these oral effects to be located, if no longer inwardly? In the admission of a resonance qualified as sinister, Conrad's public thinking of writing admits or becomes willing to transmit something of its heterogeneity. And what I'm suggesting is this is something that the first preface that I read to you disavows. He departs from the familiar Paterian line that all art aspires to the condition of music unless we are to take seriously the sonorous and vibratory condition of music. But what kind of condition? As I will show, it is a condition in extraction, the extraction of sound for language. Consider the initiating scene of Heart of Darkness. The entire novel will pass in one night aboard the ship Nellie, waiting for the turn of the tide at the threshold of London, where Marlowe, the novel's principal storyteller, will conjure another ship in another unnamed place. Marlowe never utters the words Congo or Africa. Spoken in the dark, the story draws some life from reducing the distance between here and there, now and then. Marlowe is channeling as if some direct and material line is being materialized and made to vibrate, an ur telephony. The story is one of a passionate attachment, an object that must be relinquished and whose proper place is not in experience, but in memory. Marlowe tells the story of a man he sought out, with whom he wanted desperately to speak, but then lost, whom he heard speak for only a few moments. And some of you probably recall this man's famous last words, the horror, the horror. If our position is to be akin to Marlowe's, then there must be some experience of desiring, briefly attaining, and then losing the possibility of an auditory experience, an experience that I designate the auditory asymptote. Just before announcing the presence of Marlowe, the unnamed narrator recalls a company man aboard ship playing with some dominoes. He, quote, toys architecturally with the bones. So ivory has been reshaped into this other form, but without having lost completely its sense of being a residue of extraction. A dialectical image of extraction then begins the novel in the dominoes, as they are at the same time a deconstituted image of a piano, its ivory keys. In the bones, there is a simultaneity, the out there, this other place of social reproduction, but there's also a muted sound of a piano that we never hear. The modernist symbol, as Northrop Fry wants to find it, is, quote, something material that means, by virtue of association, something more or something else, something immaterial. Here, the symbol is already beginning to shift in its register, where this something material refers to its displaced or forgotten social reproduction. These silent shards of ivory extracted from the Congo litter the ship where an event of oral storytelling will take place. Here they have been shaped into dominoes, but the image, still a symbol in the sense upheld by Valérie, resonates with its material condition in extraction. The elastic material itself in the commodity form in the piano key, ivory is acculturated into European music. Attending to this minor detail, the anonymous narrator registers without fully sensing that a shard of the Congo is within European aesthetic production as its silent material condition. According to Marx, the commodity fetish cannot speak. Though the commodity cannot speak, the speaking and screaming slave reveals for Fred Moten a secret hidden in Marx who mutes the resonance of a disavowed black life. The dialectical image of the bones becomes a dialectical sound, which is to say a resonance. The resonance is the structure of transformation by which two locations, two quantities, touch simultaneously. If the silent piano were to speak, it would be in the form of European music 
But that music is presupposed by the violent extraction of ivory. The piano would speak in Western classical music, but already in a metamorphosis akin to what we can call a forcible translation. The music's condition is the extraction of ivory in one shape and its manifestation in another place as another shape. It sound muted, but nonetheless resonant in the image itself. In Conrad's earlier aesthetic statement, there had still been some dependence on the word, the sound of a single word that he writes in his memoir of coming to writing is shouted with courage. The power of sound has always been greater than the power of sense, is how he begins his memoir. Conrad never shed his artistic commitment to a project of memory and what he called rescue work. But with the sinister resonance and the continued vibration, we are somewhere beyond or just outside of as a condition of possibility, the figure of the storyteller as a memory system. What is the phrase, a somber theme, meant to remember to point towards and to eulogize. And here I'm recalling um, <clears throat> the somber theme had to be given a sinister resonance, a tonality of its own. On the face of things, it is human atrocity. This atrocity will not be laid bare or made visible. It will be encapsulated by or communicated through the most intimate material there is, an inner ear sound. I borrow this phrase in inner ear sound from a lecture by Toni Morrison when she describes the first two lines of Beloved. Uh, one, two, four was spiteful, full of a baby's venom. And she said she wanted um, the rhythm of that line to be like an inner ear sound that would um, take up the, the reader and, and capture her and, th and throw her into the world. With this inner ear sound, it becomes difficult to say that is to theorize and silently contemplate or take up as an object of the episteme. If resonance and vibration are figures for an atrocious content or its medium. Conrad indicates something that is no longer a story in the formal sense. Something of the totality of form is being routed through its material, spirit and pure consciousness, afflicted with the burden of matter that as Marx and Engels write in the German ideology makes its appearance in the form of agitated layers of air, sound, in short, of language. The sinister resonance and con continued vibration are no longer in a realm immediately conceivable as a spoken word or a symbol, even in its most vibratory. Heart of Darkness takes up and works upon its own medium of realization and conveyance. Heart of Darkness, in some fundamental way, takes up and appropriates for itself the condition of possibility of reading conceived as an inward experience. It appropriates self-hearing. A sinister resonance is a duration or a dwelling and hanging of a residue of a sound for some indeterminate long time. We are tempted to say that in a negative aesthetic, it is boring, that it takes time, it's long violic. In the time it takes, form is appropriative. Some heterogeneous sound will dwell it will hang, it will take the shape of inwardness, that most intimate place of the self's inward animation of itself, but the heterogeneous sound will not become fully reconciled to self-hearing. The essential matter of heart of darkness is the experience of self-hearing expropriated in relation to itself. Conrad's conception of novelistic form absents itself from two key figures of the Western tradition while also leaving them in the space of the novel as empty husks, the voice of the storyteller and the voice of the pedagogical master. With the voice of the pedagogical master as it transmits a rational tradition, heteronomy is the beginning of autonomy. Autoaffection absorbs the origin in contradiction. So I write in the voice of the master as if I am writing in my own voice. Marlowe is continually haunted by a distance in that assumption. He can never make the voice his own. He continually ventriloquizes, recognizes that he is outside of the voice that is inside him. In this, in the autonomous, is the sonic trace of the heteronymous. What cannot become my voice, what cannot be captured within the sphere of speaking as myself, in that distance, there is a sinister resonance. For Lacan, the gaze is split, such that it becomes possible to be seen by looking. 
The sinister resonance is, in this way, an acoustical counterpart to the object gaze, such that it becomes possible to be heard by hearing. But if the anamorphosis, if you think about the, um, the Holbein, Holbein, Holbein painting, it localizes for Lacan the object gaze, one that implicates the viewer in the presented scene, the object sound would always be partially inward, presenting itself in the subject's self-hearing, implicated more fully in self-consciousness than the gaze, as it relates to acoustic self-presentation or self-perception. In the auditory asymptote, the question is how Marlowe's listening splits between the desire for a voice that never occurred except in fantasy, envy, we might say, in Freud's lexicon, a paternal voice that if it could have been heard would have answered all questions, but split between, with a sonorousness, one that he experiences as prior to speech and outside of speech, its extreme void into which speech and listening might fall, a castration. Moving through the sounds of darkness, Marlowe seeks out the voice of Kurtz. He waits for the imperial message. He takes up the last words in the mode of listening proper to a disciple in the rational tradition, but he receives only an empty husk, the channel of sound. If there is a hallucinatory element in Heart of Darkness, it is due to this split, the sense that there is some sound that the story must but cannot repress, that turns to within itself, not as vestige, but as its double. Marlowe desires to hear Africa just as strongly as he desires to hear Kurtz. Only the music of Africa is on the way to Kurtz. He must go through the space of music to get to the voice, voice of Kurtz, whose last words he will carry with him home. What does it mean to suggest that Heart of Darkness does not narrate or describe, but communicates? Conrad returns in Heart of Darkness to a series of scenes that populate the history of Western recitation. He rewrites its dream of communication. Conrad understood, perhaps in no way, in a way that no other Western thinker of communication of his era did, that its motivating dream is not the impulse of preservation, but of possession. The dream of communication cannot be thought outside of coloniality in general as primitive accumulation and the extraction of material. For colonialism to operate, that is, to develop its protocols, it must steal material, but also languages and voices. If communication is to operate, it must radically reduce the scope and meaning of the sound of the voice and its claim to humanity. Alexander Graham Bell invented his first telephone transmitter in 1876. The telephone functions by way of taking the human voice, its many modulations, and reducing the minimum quantum necessary for recognition in order to maximize transport. Lacan writes in Seminar 2 a passage that's also a provocation for Avital Ronel in the telephone book. Quote, the Bell Telephone Company needed to economize, that is to say, to pass the greatest number of communications down one single wire. But one communicates, one when one communicates, one recognizes the modulation of a human voice. And as a result, one has the experience of understanding, understanding which comes from the craft that one recognizes what one already knows." End quote. All messages pass indiscriminately through the circuit, which underscores what one always forgets, namely, Lacan writes, that language, this language, which is the instrument of speech, is something material. In this, he continues, the things of the heart, the conviction passed on from one individual to another, comes over in its entirety. I'm sure there's not a single person in this room who has not felt themselves to utter some conviction of the heart over the telephone and not worried at the same time that it wouldn't either reach the reader or the or a listener or that it wasn't being overheard by someone else. And um, Merleau Ponty was in the audience of, the, of this lecture and he mentioned that, well, the foundation of language is that it's universal. As Marlowe recedes into the dark aboard the ship to tell a story, something is happening to structure itself as it affords narrative levels. Narrative levels resonate. They resonate from there and then to here and now. 
conceived in a moment of technological adaptation to the wireless imagination, the form of his novel must be open and incomplete if it is to interrupt the transmission of the imperial dream. Since Lukács, the theory of the novel teaches that form is incommensurate to content. But if the content of the novel is the infinite adaptability of extraction, then this content still continues into and takes up, extracts, and adapts our moment. It is as yet incomplete. One need only remember that today minerals are extracted from the Congo to produce the smartphone in order for the truth of Heart of Darkness to be brought home as the resonating and vibrating center of a still continuing history of extraction of material for speech. The absent or distant river that overlays the river before them, so they're sitting on the River Thames listening to the River Congo, is a second location that goes without proper name in Conrad's novel. Again, Africa is a word that Marlowe never says in Heart of Darkness. But Africa is the baseline location from which all place and all setting begins in Conrad. And here I read uh, a passage from The Nigger of the Narcissus, and it sounds as if it could have come from Heart of Darkness. Nothing seems left of the whole of the universe but darkness, clamor, fury, and the ship. No one spoke and all listened. Outside the night moaned and sobbed to the accompaniment of a continuous loud tremor as if of innumerable drums beating far off. Shrieks passed through the air. Tremendous dull blows made the ship tremble while she rolled under the weight of the seas toppling on her deck. So <clears throat> Conrad won't write Heart of Darkness for another year or two, but it's as if he's already returning to the memories of what he heard in the Congo. In the Congo diaries, there's no reference of music. Um, there's only one reference to drumming. So what's provocative to me about that is that the sounds of the Congo, of Congolese music, are something that he carried with him, that he hesitated to write down until coming to Heart of Darkness. And it was, Heart of Darkness was really the only work that ever poured out of him suddenly and completely. Um, everything else was rather torturous to write. In this moment, uh, we're nowhere near the Congo, but the chasm of the open boat radiates and vibrates. Here, as in the belly of the slave ship, there is a total confrontation between what Glissant calls the powers of the written word and the impulses of orality. There is a cry of stolen, extracted, and disappeared language. The continued vibration and sinister resonance issue a profound challenge to the transcendental signifier that supports narrative levels and duration, namely the voice, the narrative voice. A generation of literary theory encourages us to the voice as a silent grammatical subject of enunciation. So when Jeanette says a voice in narrative discourse, he doesn't mean a sounding acoustical voice, but he does maintain a sense that the novel is a communicative form, is an address. Narrative theory begins from the premise, it speaks, it discourses, it reports. And we're without the vocabulary for it's an accompanying event, it's applied accompanying event, it listens. Heart of Darkness is not a recitation of a recitation, a recit. It is a recitation of listening, multiplied across spaces and dimensions. Jeanette never entertains, rest in peace, he just passed away. I could never do without Jeanette, a genius, but here I'll critique him. Um, Jeanette never entertains a sonic trace of a presupposing claim of a listening, real or imagined upon writing and its voicings. If it be a voice, figural or quasi-metaphoric, it is twinned by a concept of audibility. This hypothetical listening hovers at the fold of listening as metaphor and material, at what in the metaphor is always already material. We can call it an acousticality, that which shares in the acoustical without itself sounding. There is a conveyance. When Marlowe sits on the deck of the ship just before he is about to become invisible to the narrator, there is nothing but the voice and the telling, a voice and nothing more, as Madden Dolar might say. Everything else is in the middle of receding. To read Heart of Darkness is to read with ears pricked. 
you might remember that phrase from um, Little Han's um, dream of, of the wolves, their ears are, are pricked, to wait for the acoustical signal in the mute page. The sentences exist within this verge in a middle and transitional space to almost hear on the cusp of transformation or a tilting phenomenon. John Mill, John Stuart Mill, famously relates poetry to overhearing, a speaker confessing himself to himself in inward speech that the reader then overhears. But this fantasy, and I call it a fantasy, first depends on the experience of the lyric I as a resonance. It remains dependent on an underhearing, a minor or quasi-hearing, this almost or nearly hearing in an asymptotical direction. Jeanette had already implied a place for conveyance in narrative levels through what he calls duration. I experience narrative duration in the time that it takes. I turn pages, I course through sentences. Diegetically, the time of quiet, or as Conrad writes, waiting for the turn of the tide, had already been inscribed into Conrad's beginnings, as if gathering up the capacity to listen for someone unknown, a not yet determined signal. But there is something of narrative voice that is not the trace of a sonorous event, a representation of living speech, but its horizon in listening. There is a hypothetical event paired with a hypothetical listening. It is between the region of writing and the region of sounding. There is, to be sure, the horizontal dimension of a voice in a text that would sound out if it could. <clears throat> and in some ways, Conrad desires that um, in writing, he, he wants to scratch out his own tortured accent to arrive at a, at a pure voice. But Heart of Darkness concerns an aspect of narrative voice that regardless of its grammar is always in the subjunctive mood. It moves towards sounding but remains, even in the event of being read aloud within its own silent region. For no event of reading aloud could exhaust or encapsulate it. The horizon finds its meaning in that movement a failure to transform completely into its other. There is no original voice of which it is a copy. There is the only the possible sounding and possible hearing towards which it strives. But all resonance, we're tempted to say, is sinister in admitting heterogeneity. The essential matter of heart of darkness is the experience of self-hearing confronted, changed, and expropriated in relation to itself. In the face of the defaced figure of sinister resonance, still only a metaphor for some experience that Conrad's novel is meant to incite, we're asked to waylay the image of Africa. Africa appears and disappears in the racializing figure of a sinister resonance, which incites like the image. In 1894, Conrad wrote to his dear friend Parodowska to lament the difficulties of composing his first novel, Almayer's Folly. And he had started writing Almayer's Folly in the margins and end papers of his French copy of Madame Bovary. <laughs> and then he carries, as I mentioned before, the draft of the first seven chapters with him to the Congo, making it what I'm calling a, a trans-Pacific and transatlantic text. Um, when he's writing to Porodowska, he includes uh, in his letter to her a manuscript page from, <clears throat> I believe, chapter 11. And he's, it's, it's totally marred. You can't even read it. I should have brought it, an image for you. It's overwritten with blots and crossing out. It's, it's really scratched out. And he says, I wanted to give you the look of the thing. He writes to her in French, and this is the language that they shared in letters. Conrad never wrote fiction in French, but often his letters were in French. And I've given you a short excerpt um, from the letter, and I apologize in advance for my terrible French pronunciation. This is the last quotation on the handout. La solitude m'a gagné, elle m'absorbe. Je ne vois rien, je ne lis rien. C'est comme une espèce de tombe que serait un même temps en enfer. We are far écrié, écrié, écrié. That sounded pretty good to me. Um, my own auto affection was pleased. I'm sure everyone is already laughing on YouTube. Um, solitude wins. It absorbs me. I don't see anything. I don't read anything. It's a kind of tomb or a grave, which would be at the same time a hell 
where you have to write, write, write. Uh, Naomi, I think you'll be interested in what I have to say here. The sound effects of Conrad's sentence to Porodowska echo across two languages and perhaps more. C'est comme une espèce de tom is rhythmic and incantatory. It is a phrase written for the ear, but there's a missing agent. It's not Conrad himself, but the writing that declares it is a tomb. The sentence at the same time reaches out to an ear, com, tom, ses, espes. In its insistent repetition, the word écrié becomes an aggressive inner ear sound or harbors a resonance that seeks an interior location. One cannot but hear in the repetition a sound, one designated but also withheld by the infinite form. Um, we hear the relationship between the verb to write and to cry out. Um, écrié, écrié, écrié. Is that right? Um, there's a kind of slippage. So to write, 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 but it almost sounds like to cry, cry, cry. So writing cries out. But someone listens. The edges of written words lose what Freud calls in the psychopathology of everyday life, their acoustic demarcation. It is along this vibrating edge of the resonant tomb where I begin to hear in the auditory asymptote, to write, to cry, the sounds of the words and their optical patterns on the page, their vision and resonance, as John Hollander might say. This is a claim on behalf of close reading as close listening, but there's a surplus. I can't close the gap, and it's where the words begin to bleed. Conrad wrote this letter uh, after, he had shared, after she had shared with him a bit of her own writing in progress. And so he sent in return his marred manuscript page of Almeyer's Folly. Um, and it's been remarked upon at length by Michael Fried in, in a brilliant essay. And he writes about this manuscript page as containing, quote, a particular phantasmatic relation to the blank page at the heart of Conrad's fiction. Marred, illegible, crossed out, nearly destroyed. Writing here bears no essential relation to the inward unless it be of self-annihilation. And in another chapter of my book, and I can't go into it here, it's along this axis that I consider Conrad's relationship to the racial slur, so the blackness of the marred page. It's not a vanishing mediator, but with a capacity to mar and decimate what it records. He does not intend Porodowska to read this page, but to witness it in the tenor of a masochistic fantasy. A child is being beaten. Writing is indeed an artifact of the inward, but shattered by aggressive affect. The inward is here divided in its objects, the good page and the bad page, the beloved page and the hated, aggressed page. Conrad begins when he writes to her, forgive me for not having written sooner, but I am in the midst of struggling to the death with chapter 11, a struggle to the death, you know? If I let go, I am lost. He sends Porodowska the first page to give you an idea of the appearance of my manuscript. This I owe you since I have seen yours. <laughs> One cannot help but hear a genital fantasy at the heart of this scene, a castrating experience of sexual difference that orients and subsumes the act and art of writing. He offers her an aggressive gift of the page and with it an autobiographical visage. It is an image of his own face that might sound forth the artifact of marred voice. That's also where I hear in my book um, the pronunciation of the racial slur. Music, he says, is the art of arts. It seems impossible that music might grow out of the written page, language being what Benjamin calls music's rightful antithesis, unless this music be a scream or a cry. So I would suggest that he, he somehow rewrites or rehears this event in Heart of Darkness when he writes, and I, I didn't give to you this passage, but I'll read it. <clears throat> we had a glimpse of the towering multitude of trees, of the immense matted jungle with the blazing little ball of the sun hanging over it, all perfectly still, and then the white shutter came down again smoothly as if sliding in the greased grooves. I ordered the chain which we had begun to heave in to be paid out again. Before it stopped running with a muffled rattle, a cry, a very loud cry, 
as of infinite desolation, soared slowly in the opaque air. It ceased. That's really nice. Soared slowly in the opaque air. A cry, a very loud cry, éclier, éclier. Colonialism is nowhere uttered in the letter to Poradowska concerning his first novel, but the shattered bonds of colonial desire are everywhere felt in its sounds. When Marlowe hears this music from afar, he confronts a correlate to, to cinema's acousmetra, or the acousmatic voice. Only the human voice in Michel Chion's analytic rises to the omnipotent status of the acousmetre. One doesn't feel heard by sounds in the way that human voices, even at their most creaturely, command the point of entry into the symbolic. To the extent that Marlowe hears these voices as human, he hears them as being with a capacity for speech. The cry, the shriek, the moan. These are voices, but voices brought to the, brought to the brink, the edge of communication. The cry does not say I or me. It does not take itself as an object. It is not split, but rather splits the one who hears it. We can liken the sounding darkness to the contours of dark earth, trees, and dancing bodies as seen by Zizek in the, in the paintings of Munch, whose visual correlate is the acousmetre, quote, the voice which transgresses the boundary of outside inside, since it belongs neither to diegetic reality nor to the external voice accompaniment, but lurks in the in-between space like a mysterious foreign body which disintegrates from the consistency of reality, end quote. The acousmetre returns us to the horror of the maternal body. Zizek writes, and in a language that will strike us as grounded in the aesthetics of heart of darkness, quote, the horror of an all-present voice whose body all of a sudden emerges out of nothing and without ordinary corporeality. Um, I can't really get into it in this talk, but one thing I'm quite critical of in my book is the race categories that often support um, Zizek and also Xion's thinking of, of the acousmatic voice as coming out of the darkness and out of the blackness. Um, and especially Xion is writing in a moment of decolonization. Uh, maybe about 10 more minutes, so I'll, I'll, I'll read maybe a final section. When Conrad suggested that Heart of Darkness hangs in the air and dwells at the air long after the last note had been struck, he is describing something that has, in its physical or external manifestation, disappeared. One is done reading, the book is finished, and yet a sound lingers. Form resonates and vibrates. The form of the novel for Lukács is what he calls dissonant, related to a gap between man and the infinite. But this is a purely formal dissonance without audibility, or what I've been following as an acousticality or vibration, a touch by writing. The transcendental homelessness he describes in the theory of the novel no doubt makes itself felt in substantial ways in Conrad's exilic consciousness. His acts of writing were presupposed by the dissolution of a nation and by participation in the extreme brutality of colonialism. Homelessness in Conrad is not purely transcendental in this regard, but a lived memory bearing some crudely healed scar. And here I'm conscious of um, the notion of the scar, a spirit healing all of its scars. The novel, Benjamin suggests after Lukács, displaces the storyteller. If the sinister resonance and continued vibration, uh, in the sinister resonance and continued vibration, Conrad does not name a storytelling voice, as we've often supposed Marlowe is. He's a storyteller. Rather, and this is really my thesis, he names a symbol that has lost all determination to become an acoustic register. When Marlowe announces himself in Twilight, it is a voice that will lose through the conditions of hypothetical listening and implied reading all determination no longer to speak in any precise sense. The acoustic register loosens the synonymy of the communicable and the translatable. It works at some level that, while stimulated by language, is nonetheless paralinguistic, a draining out of referentiality. In the storyteller, Benjamin writes, quote, a man listening to a story is in the company of the storyteller. Even a man reading one shares in this companionship. 
The reader of the novel, however, is isolated more so than any reader. For even the reader of a poem is ready to utter the words for the benefit of the listener. In this solitude of his, the reader of a novel seizes upon his material more jealously than anyone else. He is ready to make it completely his own, to devour it, as it were. Indeed, he destroys. He swallows up the material as the fire devours logs in the fireplace." End quote. <laughs> so the audile scene of transformation from the story to the novel is remarkable. To read is to share in companionship, even while reading alone but only on the condition that one is ready to utter the words for the benefit of an imagined listener. This readiness to utter the words indicates that something of a musicality of writing wants to sound out. The novel, by Benjamin's estimation, resists being read aloud. And in resisting being read aloud, resists relation. It is here that a sonorous materiality is converted into another kind of material a property devoured and destroyed. But even in the log in the fireplace, it leaves behind an ash, something that cannot be used and which exists as detritus or waste. By the acoustic register, a voice that has lost determination then, I mean a leftover of the work of internalization. The sinister resonance as a leftover or byproduct of some extractive process begins to make itself felt. And when I say, too, that a voice has lost its determination, I'm recalling also um, the German, um, the bestimmt. There's, there, the stimme is, is in the heart of what, of what determination is in German. It has been bevoiced. Something has been given its voice. Um, das stimmt. It's true. It's, it is so. It has been voiced. To be sure, Benjamin laments that stories are no longer to be continued, a limitation in lived experience as it might become an object of narrative. He writes, after all, counsel is less an answer to a question than a proposal concerning the continuation of Forsetzung of a story which is just unfolding. To seek this counsel, Rat, one would first have to be able to tell the story quite apart from the fact that a man is receptive to counsel only to the extent that he allows his situation to speak. And so when Benjamin writes that, um, that the reader of the novel has a profound per perplexity, I think is the phrase in, that we say in English, it's tiefe Ratzlosigkeit, uh, counsellessness, being without counsel. So already there's a kind of absenting of, a, of an acoustic scene of an exchange in counsel. Before anything that might be called a story, there is first a transmutation of a situation into a voice. Before I be, can be counseled, I must first allow my situation to speak. So that I can tell is first a condition. It's not that the novel eclipses storytelling, but that it is the form that becomes adequate to an unspeakable narrative situation and without counsel. Such death is both total and at a distance. It is unavailable to narrative and to counsel. In the hermeneutics of the subject, Foucault writes that for the Greeks, quote, listening is the first moment of the process by which the truth which has been heard, listened to, and properly taken in sinks into the subject, so to speak, becomes embedded in him, and begins to become his own, sus, and thus forms the matrix for ethos. But if we recall Kurtz's last words, the horror, the horror, there's something of these last words that resist sinking in. They may be recorded and repeated, but not embedded or internalized as a pragma. Heart of Darkness speaks without proposing a basis for ethos or conduct. <clears throat> for those of you who have read Chinua Shebe's very famous critique of Heart of Darkness, that's his main critique, as he says, you know, uh, Conrad fails to give an alternative frame of reference. Another way of putting that would be that the novel lacks any counsel. We speak of words as resonating with, within us. Hegel begins the second volume of Aesthetics with resonance to argue that resounding is more ideal for, than corporeality, for it is a mode of expression adequate to inner life. 
Nothing is left behind in this adequation between the inner and its mode of expression, and the resonance is total, pure, without any remainder or corporeal trace. When I say, that resonates with me, I say your words have become for a moment adequate to my inner life. The sinister resonance appropriates this adequation to become a, side of the, a sign of the outside, a hanging in the ear. In the Western philosophical tradition, if you are in my ear, you are inside me in the most idealized sense. You are there even when you are not. In listening to you, I listen to myself. This is why Plato says thought is internal dialogue. Thought continually gives the impression that we are answering to someone. To transform the master's speech into one's own, particularly in the development of ethos, is the work of idealization. This self-subjectivation -subject is nothing but the reduction of the space of the outside to be able to hear oneself speak. This is why it is paramount that Conrad contrasts the voice of the master with the music that surrounds it. The music of the Congo interrupts the work of idealization. The ethnocentric sound of Africa is, however, reduced once again to the space of the ship as the space of conversion of the outside to the inside. Marlowe's narrative continually refuses to domesticate the music or to make it his own. It is clear that the men who surround Marlowe are not only those who do not listen, only one will, he's our narrator, but only those who don't remember or forget on command. They have no stories to tell, ready participants in erasure. Oblivion means in this case, Nicole Leroux writes, quote, the shadow cast by the political on memory. She suggests a nearly etymological relation between amnesia and amnesty. Marlowe remains in this way jointly insensitive to the violence he sanctions, keeps safe and shelters in his voice, and its scene of reproduction aboard ship. And here I'm recalling one archaic meaning of the logo says shelter. Don't be um, scared by my stack of paper. I know I only have a few minutes. A sinister resonance directs us to a spoken word, and one with the political weight of testimony. But at first, it depends upon an abstract conveyance that might host its event. For there to be testimony, there must first be an opening, an audibility. For there to be understanding, and with it someone who can hear, anonymous and implicitly universal, who is its subject, there must first be a resonance, an event of self-hearing, consciousness being for itself in its immediacy. This is perhaps why we have the feeling that Conrad's narrative ends in a circle that just misses its touching point to fail to connote its virtual shape of a circle. In describing Heart of Darkness as a note dwelling on the ear, Conrad recognizes that the novel is something other than a form traditionally conceived and that it operates within the structure of communication that with Saussure is universalized to include all linguistic acts. And if you can recall the image of the circuit in um, his lectures, the circuit between phonation and audition as a kind of perfect circle or journey of phoné, the circuit between phonation and audition. But the sinister resonance is nothing like a noise that a signal must overcome or be shielded from to be communicated. The sinister resonance presupposes some remainder of the informational field. In describing form through the qualities of a sound that hangs long after, Conrad begins from that premise. The hanging sound is not secondary to the novel, but primary. It assumes for itself its own leftover as form. That assumption is in no way a sublation. The sinister resonance persists in its status as other. Did it not, the work would merely be said to resonate. The story of Heart of Darkness, to some extent, resolves. The novel begins on a ship on the River Thames and returns there uh, at the end. But there has been no hermeneutic circle, the form cut by its own movement. We are somewhere outside of the structures afforded by Saussure's theory of language. We can only grasp the sinister resonance as a movement of remaindering if we recall with Fred Moten that structural linguistics was from the beginning a theory of value. 
it claims not to need certain materialities that outlast their use. And here, Saussure writes in a passage that is quoted by Moton, in any case, it is impossible that sound as a material element should in itself be part of the language. Sound is merely something ancillary, a material the language uses. Linguistic signals are not, in essence, phonetic. They are not physical in any way. They are constituted solely by differences which distinguish one such sound pattern from another. It's not that the circuit disposes of the tangible element that serves as its vehicle. It is that phonetic essence is carried along with the linguistic signal and remains in a kind of indisposed state. In extraction, communication takes only what it needs. Any speech event is, according to Jakobsen, an act of communication that adheres to the following theorem. The addressor sends a message to the addressee. A message requires context, quote, seizable by the addressee and I, as either verbal or capable of being verbalized, end quote. It requires, finally, contact or what he calls a physical channel and psychological connection between the addressor and the addressee that allows entrance into and continuation of communication. So I wish I had here the image of phonation as the circuit and it renders visibly the epistemology of the sea journey that also determines the poetics of electroacoustics. As Jonathan Stern and Tara Rogers point out, most of our vocabulary for electroacoustics is drawn from the epistemology of the voyage. We speak of a flow, a channel, a wave. It is the idealized image, the circuit, held by Conrad's narrator, who still believes when the story begins in leaving home and returning. It is only the narration of the journey that opens the circuit to some tangent and some movement. Though Sassur does not render it graphically, an outer rim of the circuit exists and includes the vibrations of the sounds which travel from mouth to the ear, as well as an inner rim of the circuit that includes everything else. Sassur does not say what comprises everything else. There is in this outer rim a series of errant vibration. One thing is clear in the image of phonation. Nothing of value that can be recuperated for a theory or that can be recuperated for a theory of value falls errantly or fugitively outside of the circuit. In hanging in the air and dwelling on the ear, the sinister resonance has its life in this outer rim. Um, I just want to leap ahead to one very short thing, cognizant that I should come to an end. <clears throat> there is in the word sinister itself a connotation and a displacement. When he says sinister resonance, it's as if there's an avoidance of pronouncing some other word. Ethnocentric, it figures without directly naming an African musical content, but also some experience charged by a libidinal conveyance and by a recurrence in memory. But as it displaces, it connotes the left side, the sinister, something left aside. The single hand of the writer is limited, and one of his hands hangs limp, <laughs> castrated and useless. Amanda, I hope you enjoy this. But as a piano player, Kurtz, we're told, is a great musician, he would have had what Melville might call sinister dexterity, two-handedness. The left or sinister hand is with a nearly universal capacity to conjure evil. As uh, Robert Hertz, who's an anthropologist, at the turn of the last century, he wrote an incredible essay tracing the meaning of the left across nearly every culture. The left hand is put under the right in a polite embrace. The left hand is underhanded or what is underneath but threatens to return. Notions of the left side proliferate words in their wake. And uh, Hertz writes, for even words with happy meanings, what a, when applied by antiphrasis to the left, are quickly contaminated what they express and acquire a sinister quality which soon forbids their use. More recent words like the English droit from Latin directum expresses the idea of a force which goes straight to its object. So droit as right, it goes direct, to be adroit. 
The continued vibration is a force, but its movement is indirect. It does not go straight to the object, but circuitously. It contaminates, proliferates, and returns after having been gone. The sinister resonance is torturous, oblique, abortive. The outside, the infinite, hostile, and the perpetual menace of evil. These are all phrases that Hertz uses in relation to uh, the left. In drumming amongst the, Lu the Wulwanga tribe of Australia, the right hand holds the stick that strikes, which is the man, the left hand being the stick, the woman that receives the blows. The, hand receives the right hand receives benediction in Genesis, while the left hand both annuls and propagates death. And here I'll come to an end. So the figure becomes physicalized. The act of reading is already a resonance, a continued vibration. But in being given this sensorial shape, in the intimate and inward part of self, the index of atrocity is itself physicalized. And in the next section, which I can't get to, what I start to think about is the sexual valences of this. Um, rape uh, was already a technology being used in the Congo. And um, uh, Casement notes it in his report on the Congo. He uses the phrase um, that he witnessed what's unfit for repetition. And uh, it's likely that Conrad witnessed something akin to that as well. So there's a kind of um, sexual trauma, I think, localized in the sinister resonance, but also a kind of colonial desire or miscegenation. The sinister resonance and continued vibration stimulate and agitate some invisible part of the body. There's a kind of clitoral um, connotation there. The part of the body that's usually reserved for warmth. The form of the novel is autoerotic. It becomes apparent in the shape of the desires it stimulates. All of sexuality, Freud argues, begins in an infantile scene of hearing the mother's voice. Fantasy then intercedes in hearing without seeing in hearing a sound and eroticizing the possibility of seeing. Conrad's figures are so ambiguous, so anonymous, that they are hardly visualizable. No one, strictly speaking, will appear in such a shape. It is anonymous. There is nothing except the desire to see on the other side of a sound. But see what? Or is this vision without object? It's in there.